Um, my name is Margo Smith. I'm the director of Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection. And I uh, want to welcome you tonight to our webinar. Before we proceed, I want to acknowledge that Kluge Roo and the University of Virginia are located on the land of the Monica Nation. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And since we're all joining from locations around the world, I want to acknowledge the indigenous nations where we, each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those indigenous people are, that you find out and learn about them and their art and culture. I also wanna thank our sponsors, Australia Council for the Arts, UVA Arts Council, and the Vice Provost for the Arts at UVA. This webinar is associated with the exhibition Bumali Prints and Paper Making Space as an Art Collective, which is on display at Kluge Roo through June 19th, 2022. This exhibition was curated by six students in Professor Douglas Fordham's class, Indigenous Prints and People. And um, one of those curators is with us tonight as our moderator. Brendan O'Donnell's graduate uh, is in the graduate program in the Department of Art at the University of Virginia where he focuses on contemporary practice in and of the Arctic region. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with Brendan and his cohort of curators on this exhibition. And I just wanna mention that they have a, a book, a catalog for the exhibition that's forthcoming. It should arrive just about any day now. So I'm gonna turn this over to Brendan and um, I'll come back on in the end to thank our speakers. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Margo. And to those of you joining us from the United States, good evening. And for those of you logging in from Australia, good morning, including our two guests today. It's truly a pleasure to be here, to be part of this conversation and to introduce our guests, artists Thea Anamara Perkins and Katie West. Before we begin, however, I would like to take a moment to collectively acknowledge the continued suffering uh, that is caused by war, violence, and white supremacist ideologies. Thank you. Well, as Margot mentioned, my name is Brendan, and I am a student in the graduate program in art and architectural history at the University of Virginia. I was fortunate to be a part of a really great curatorial team for the exhibition currently on view, and that show celebrates an iconic moment in 1987 when 10 contemporary Aboriginal artists came together in Sydney to reimagine what it could mean to be a contemporary Aboriginal artist. Well, it's been 35 years since Bumali's inaugural exhibition, so we wanted to know what's been happening in that space Bumali created. What does it mean to be an emerging First Nations artist in contemporary Australia? Are there limits that remain, barriers that still need to be broken down? And how are young Aboriginal artists today using their practices to engage with the social and political issues of our time? Thea Anamara Perkins is an Arente and Kalkadun artist who practice, whose practice incorporates portraiture and landscape to depict authentic representations of First Nations peoples and country. With a delicate hand, Thea answers heavy questions about what it means to be Indigenous in contemporary Australia and how Aboriginal people can and should be portrayed. She has worked in a broad range of community projects and is also an active member of SEED, Australia's first Indigenous youth-led climate network. Thea won the Alice Prize and Dreaming Award in 2020 and the Brett Whiteley Traveling Arts Scholarship in 2021. Katie West is an artist and Ijibarndi woman based in Noongar Baladong country, working in installation, textiles, and social practice. The process and notion of naturally dying fabric underpin her practice. The rhythm of walking, gathering, bundling, boiling water and infusing materials with plant matter. Using found and naturally dyed textiles, video and sound, Katie creates installations, textile pieces, and this is my favorite word in art, happenings uh, that invite attention to the ways we weave our stories, places, histories, and futures. 
Katie has presented solo exhibitions at Perth Institute of Contemporary Art, Tarawara Museum of Art, Healesville, and West Space Melbourne for Next Wave Festival 2016, and participated in group exhibitions nationally and internationally, including the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art Melbourne and Shimmer in Rotterdam. Thea and Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to each of your presentations and our discussion, which will follow. So as we mentioned at the beginning, everyone joining today is welcomed and encouraged to type questions into the Q&A field during the presentations, and we'll be sure to address them during the conversation. Um, all right, Thea, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you uh, to share your screen. Hi there. Um, yes, my name's uh, Thea um, Anamara Perkins, and um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the Gadigal um, people on whose country I'm speaking to you today, um, where I'm based in Sydney. Um, and I also have um, family ties to the Redfern community here. Um, so my practice is definitely centered around um, contemporary experience of being a First Nations person. And I'd like to also say that um, like those Biennale artists are definitely some of my big heroes. Um, and their influence is still definitely being felt today. So it's really beautiful to be able to um, be speaking in this space. Um, my work centers around representation and um, I guess also the paradigms surrounding that. Um, I've grown up sort of being from Alice Springs or Umbandwa and being, and through my mother, who's a curator, being exposed to a lot of the central um, and Western desert painting and really being inspired by that movement. Um, but then also, you know, spending a lot of my life here in Sydney, also being exposed to that contemporary Western tradition. And I guess, my work is about reconciling the two and in some ways um, using that traditional Western lens of portraiture and landscape painting, kind of appropriating it almost to subvert it and infuse it with my views and understanding of, you know, the world as a First Nations person. Um, so there's been a few um, kind of salient themes throughout my work. And one of the things that I've always done and returned to is um, portraiture and my family archives. Um, because I find that portraiture is such a beautiful way of um, expressing myself and what I know about um, Aboriginal people in a way that is, or, it, or a vernac vernacular that is readily kind of understood and absorbed, I guess, by the other, because it's very important to me to be able to make that leap for other people to understand it. So this work, um, oh, sorry, wrong caption, but um, this work, titled Shimmer One is a self-portrait and again comes back to this idea um, of reflecting on my personal experience as a First Nations person, because I think self-portraiture is a really kind of confronting um, thing to do and it provided the space to kind of meditate on my practice and myself and my experience. Um, this idea of Shima came from when I was in um, Mbandwa in Alice Springs working with my auntie Rachel on recording the traditional Aranda songs. Um, we don't have very good records of them and because it's an oral history when they're gone they're lost. Um, but one of the public songs that came out of it 
um, rough, one of the lyrics roughly translates to, I am a woman and I am shimmering, which I thought was such a beautiful kind of thing. It not only has this kind of spiritual connotation of power and shimmer, it also had this beautiful aesthetic thing, but it was also to me an assertion of the beautiful matriarchy um, in our culture. And when I came back to Sydney, um, I was just walking along the coastline here and I saw the water shimmering at sunset. And it was this most, it, it's such a beautiful kind of um, sublime thing. And it made me realize that, um, you know, it's this idea of shimmer, it's everywhere. And I can be separated from my country, you know, having to live this life in urban places. Um, but it's always, it's omnipresent. It's all encompassing. Um, yeah, and so it was kind of, um, this series um, grew out of that. Um, yeah, and, and as a kind of a gentle way to, of um, expanding the narrative and talking about, you know, the boldness and the brilliance of my people. Um, so this work is part of the, um, again, continues this idea of um, shimmer um, and this idea of like females. And it's, um, I think it's just a, like, it's such a gentle, but really powerful subversion to take that tradition that is really kind of um, white and male dominated and have an Aboriginal woman painting Aboriginal women and that space, which is a really beautiful space, I think. Um, between that of between sisters and um, I think what's also interesting through you know my journey with connecting up in Mbandwa has been you know like learning a lot of my stories and a recurring theme um, is that of sisters and they go on these epic journeys and I think that it has echoes in contemporary life you know and what's beautiful about our culture like the dreaming is that you know, it, it can bend and encompass something that happened 60,000 years ago with what's happening today in our lives. And it doesn't break, it absorbs that and is stronger for it. So that, that was kind of delving into that idea and also the female space. And it was also um, tied to this idea of glimmer, uh, which is another, um, you know, obviously light is a big theme. And I think that, um, you know, light is in photographs, it's in painting, it's in, it's in something as immaterial as memory, it's contiguous, it's a glue. And that was a big kind of strong point for me. Um, um, which also takes me to, um, oh, sorry, um, and Glimmer is um, also came from hearing um, this term, which is used in psychology, and it's actually the inverse of a trigger point and a glimmer is an instance of safety and belonging and I thought that that was beautiful because you know there's an extremely dark history when you're talking about First Nations people um, in Australia and even my family history um, with colonization and also but it's ongoing um, and there's like you know it's it's kind of unrelenting but I thought it would be it's a beautiful thing to add also the beautiful things we are such a, the reason that we have survived is the strength of our families, you know? So it was also looking into that and conveying that so that when people, you know, there's a, a sea of misrepresentation. So putting in representation that's, you know, in my control, you know? Um, and also lately I've been working on um, landscape paintings and they're, in a way, um, portraits in themselves. Like this is where my pop was born and where he rests. And it was also the site of the, it's the site of the telegraph station, which was where the half caste institution was in Alice Springs and where he was removed to. Um, it's also where the Todd River flows, which is a very kind of powerful force. Water is such a powerful, precious thing in the desert. Um, and there's a spring that runs beneath this site. So. Um, the landscape tradition is also something um, that has like a very colonial history. So it's repurposing that and infusing it with my connection to place and my love of country. Yeah. 
and it, here's another wider view of the um, the shimmering coastline that was part of the exhibition and another um, series of sisters, um, which was my mother and my aunt. So it's been a through line. And I think that concludes it. That's wonderful, thank you. And I really appreciate this talk about shimmering and glimmering. This is something I had mentioned to you before, this idea of the glimmer uh, that attracts you in these photographs. And that's something you like to sort of pull from that and, and use as inspiration for your portraits, your painted portraits. But I didn't know where the idea of glimmer came from. And that's just brilliant. I love this idea of the inverse of a trigger and what that then makes possible when someone can connect with that, that energy that they can connect with. That's really quite beautiful. Thank you. Where did you, where did you come across this, this idea of glimmer as the inverse of, you said it was a psychological or a psychology term. Was this something yeah, was, you read about? Yeah, it was just through um, like research, you know, and it's just like being generally um, interesting. And then I came kind of like read a bit more about it and yeah. And it really resonated with, um, you know, because I often um, with my work, I'm led by compulsion and it'll off, like it'll often take a while before I can kind of put my finger on what that was. So when um, I found that it really helped like articulate what it, like the kind of abstract thing that had been percolating, I guess. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I want to uh, have now that Katie's back with us, I want to make sure that she can do her presentation. But I, I'm really excited to come back to some of these topics that you brought up for our for our group discussion afterwards. In particular, you know, I think this idea of the family archive and working with First Nations families and and portraiture and the power that that holds. One of the um, wonderful artists who's part of the Bumali exhibition is Jeffrey Samuels, and he is a survivor of the stolen generations. And so one of the uh, issues that comes across that he tries to deal with in some of his work, of course, is reconnecting with ideas of family. And so this is something that, that I hope we can revisit uh, when, we, when we come back to these conversations uh, when Katie is done. But, for now, thank you very much, Thea. This was wonderful, and it was great for people to see uh, some of your, your artwork. Katie, if you're available to share your screen, is your video working? Ah, hello, perfect. That is great. I know it's quite early, I believe, where you are, right? So good morning, good Friday morning. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, and so you can see my screen now, just making sure? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Okay, so Kaya, hello. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I will start by acknowledging Noongar country and people. I was born on Wajak Noongar Buja, where I'm speaking from today. And I grew up on Uat Buja, um, Noongar Buja on a wheat and sheep farm turned aquaculture farm just north of here. And I currently live in a small wheat belt town on uh, Nunga Baladong Buja. I love this country deeply and I feel a great sense of gratitude for the custodianship practiced by Nunga people for all time. So I will introduce my practice with a few key works, beginning with one of my first major commissions and some pieces that came about and were exhibited whilst I was studying uh, masters in contemporary art at the Victorian College of Art uh, in Melbourne. I will also touch on some key experiences and revelations that happened in that time and have had a lasting influence on my practice and general outlook on life. At first, it seems important to say that my family is very much affected by the Stolen Generations policies. In 1969, my mother was removed from her mother's care at birth. My mother grew up with a white family in a small country town in the south of the state, while our country in the Pilbara region um, was many thousands of kilometres north. I also grew up in the care of my adoptive grandparents as well. Um, and more recently, I've been reflecting on 
not just my mother's experience of adoption, but also my own. As a younger person, I found art was a space where I could make sense of my mother's experience and how this affected my siblings and I. Through my work, I have considered ways to form a sense of connection to country. Uh, the more immediate family I did not get the chance to know and my ancestors. I have worried about the impacts of transgenerational trauma and for many years carried a deep grief through not knowing family, my country and inheriting ways of knowing, doing and making. My art practice has been a way to heal and create a healthier inheritance for future generations of my family. The first uh, work I will talk about is entitled Decolonist. This uh, installation involved a video naturally dyed silk using eucalyptus leaves and bark. Um, and uh, it was commissioned by Next Wave Festival, presented at the gallery West Space in Melbourne uh, in 2016. So the video component of this work uh, was essentially a guided meditation. Central to the video was uh, this uh, diagram, which represents the third space. Uh, it's a kind of a tool that I was using while I was teaching in a university context, uh, teaching Indigenous health to a range of health students. Um, it was a core unit that everyone studying health had to do. And we use this concept to explain um, the idea of there being a working space where Western worldviews and Indigenous worldviews would merge um, and presenting that as the idea, this is where you're working as a health professional. Uh, if you're working with uh, Indigenous colleagues or, um, or clients. Uh, with this concept, I, um, I was confronted by it at the time. I wondered whether I had ever really truly experienced a context that was uh, entirely um, dominated by Indigenous worldviews. Um, and uh, the unit itself was difficult. We had students that were um, very compassionate, but also very nervous because um, for not wanting to say the wrong thing. And then we had students who were outright resistant to the content. Uh, I would also meditate before class just to calm down. I did find after a few semesters of teaching this unit that um, I was being confronted with many of the social determinants of health that were um, impacting my family and even playing out in certain issues in real time. Um, so I found meditation very, very useful. Um, and then I kind of came to this sense that um, perhaps everyone in the class could do with uh, uh, taking a bit of time to calm down so that we could have some meaningful discussion about the topics as well. So the other part of the inter installation was a kind of uh, skeleton structure of uh, the Australian flag. Uh, working with the flag became important to me because I was having really difficult conversations with my own family about um, the, the non-Indigenous people in my family about Australia Day uh, versus Invasion Day. And I think um, uh, I, in my sort of early 20s, uh, this, there was a real arc up in Australian nationalism. And um, yeah, we're just finding that really, um, really confronting. So the flag, or a skeleton of the flag was placed in the space um, as a way to kind of put forward a curly kind of question, which was what would Australian national identity be if it was underpinned by Indigenous worldviews? Um, 
uh, in reality, I don't really think that Indigenous world views in a general way result in this uh, concept of a nation state that we know now. Um, but I did feel the need to, to put this question out there into like a mainstream Australian audience. So uh, placed underneath the flag was um, kind of the, the remnants of the, the dye process I used to infuse the materials for this installation. Um, so I had the leftover silk, um, some thread and needles. Um, and then later uh, when we had a tactile tour, these were materials were on hand and also um, during the artist talk, uh, everyone was invited to take some leaves um, and thread and a needle and, um, and sew these pieces together um, as uh, they first listened to me explain the work, but then it opened up into a, um, a wider discussion amongst all of us. So um, the, the idea to kind of have the materials in the space and also invite people to participate in the way I made the work as well um, was from my own experience of joining in at um, weaving workshops um, at different times. I feel like there's a kind of um, a magic change in energy that happens when uh, people are given something to do with their hands like weaving and, um, and also sort of placed in a group amongst a group of people they don't necessarily know, feel like um, there's a kind of connectivity that happens um, between people like you, you just start to, to chat with the people that you're shoulder to shoulder with as, as you're making. Um, so very interested in that kind of focus that comes through making um, and the kind of intimacy that can come through that way of making together. Uh, this is an image of the, that um, uh, artist talk as well. So as a result of that event, I met a very special friend and collaborator, Fayenda Evie. Uh, now we have a project called uh, Museum Incognita, which um, was really sparked by the question, what would a decolonized museum be? Um, again, like this is a few years ago now, this seems like a really simple question. And um, I think there's a, uh, a like lots of different ways I would talk about that now, which, which might reveal itself as I talk. <laughs> um, so after meeting, uh, Fayan invited me to join her, her family and some of her friends um, to share the natural dyeing process. So I was just starting out with um, at her bush property on Jaja Warung country in the old Goldfields region, uh, north of Melbourne. So this was the first time I got to do this practice on quite a large scale. We had a piece of silk that was many metres long and um, uh, also have a heap of people help me with the process as well. So we all went walking and collecting plant material. So um, I remember it had been a really windy day, um, few days. And uh, so there was lots of leaf matter on the ground and lots of bark. So we were just collecting up that. And um, I also noticed that um, lots of people in the group would pick up things that I wouldn't necessarily think um, to add to the dye bundle. So um, uh, yeah, that was just a, interesting development. Um, so we uh, laid all the material, um, plant material out on the silk um, and then uh, rolled it all up tightly and then placed it on uh, in a pot of boiling water that had been boiling away on the fire. Um, and then uh, we all went off to 
um, view the performance of another guest who was um, actually uh, the fabulous Cecilia Bucunia. Uh, so she performed uh, with the frogs and a couple of other friends um, uh, by uh, a dam that was close by. Um, so the following day after everyone had left, uh, Bayan, um, her son and I kind of unfurled the bundle um, after it had cooled down in the pot overnight. And um, we, as we unraveled it and noticed all of the um, various tannins um, in the silk and all the patterns, um, we really felt like it was a, a record of that time and place um, that was all of us gathering together and sharing each other's practices. So the following year in 2017, uh, I was invited to go to uh, Roeburn in the Pilbara, which is where um, my, my um, grandmother lived um, and where she was living when she was uh, pregnant with my mother um, and also just lived out her whole, whole life there basically. Um, so this was the first time going back to Roeburn as an adult. I'd visited a number of times before as a, as a kid, but um, yeah, this was the first time going kind of on, on my own. Um, so I spent two weeks there and um, I was there to share the dying practice. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I look at these photos and I think um, they're just so beautiful <laughs> to me. Um, I, I love the colours and um, uh, just have uh, really beautiful memories of this time. Um, and just like the freedom of driving around the place and then stopping and lighting a fire sort of anywhere and um, being able to use plants that um, from that area, which my family has had a connection to for a long, long time. Um, but th the reality of this trip is I got really, really sick. I think I was just so, so dressed <laughs> and um, uh, just confronted with with all of that family history sort of like yeah coming down pretty heavy like I got sick when I was there and I got sick again once I got home as well um, back to Melbourne um, but the kind of um, amazing thing that happened like within all that I just felt like this this is just the beginning of this uh, rebuilding this connection. And I also met an elder um, who uh, had their own stolen generations experience. They were in their eighties and uh, grew up on a mission in Perth. Um, and they made their way back. Um, I think they decided to live in Robin again in their fifties, but in, that, in those decades, um, uh, Bigley had gained all of this um, incredible plant knowledge. Um, so she's just amazing at collecting seeds and even propagating those seeds. And if you know anything about Australian native plants, it's a really, really difficult propagating um, uh, native seeds, um, but she's able to do it. Um, but she took me out on a few trips and just showed me like a handful of plants, told me their names, um, how to uh, collect it, different things, um, just a bit, a little bit about what time of year they're useful and all of that. And um, she kind of uh, really made me realize um, all of this learning that is, is ahead of me. And uh, this was really important in kind of counteracting this really strong narrative about um, which seems embedded in uh, what I'd come to understand about transgenerational trauma, um, that once you're disconnected from your family and country, that's it, the culture's gone, that's, it's all over. 
um, which I think is also really part of the assimilation narrative and like part of uh, part of its structure and part of its violence. But um, yeah, meeting Bigley really, um, uh, yeah, really disrupted that negative narrative. And um, I, now I feel like I can walk, through, um, drive through that country and just being familiar with a few plants, I feel like I know something and that knowledge is gonna grow. Um, so this work here um, uh, is, uh, it's called One Square Metre. And um, I was basically invited to be part of a show at King's Artist Run, which is right in the city in Melbourne. And it's, uh, it's in an area which I think is quite close to the docks. Um, and in the creating of those docks, uh, there, there was an incredible wetland in that area. And um, I think, yeah, some of the land was sort of, um, the water was kind of filled in to create um, uh, jetties and the, create the port essentially. So, and I think it's one of those places, it's, it's dense city concrete. Um, and I think it's one of those places where people can just go, uh, like, this is like nature doesn't exist here, um, to put it really, really simply. Um, so for this work, I uh, basically installed a tarp that's um, a metre square, uh, and then um, got some plants from a native plant nursery. Um, kind of specific um, to, to that area. Um, and uh, these, these particular plants are um, kind of riparian plants. So they, they, they were there growing in the um, gallery space for a while. And then um, after the show, uh, they were planted in my garden. Um, and this, this work is entitled Warana Ground. So Warana means ground in Indramandi language. Um, and this work again was following on from that one square metre thing. And um, uh, I feel like th this work was a real um, funny transition in my practice. So I had, um, I had this issue where like, for example, I really struggled with uh, even just drawing anything from my mind on a blank page. Um, and this is why I gravitated towards fabric because it's kind of like a found object and it comes with its own context. So um, calico became uh, really, really important. Um, just thinking about the kind of utility of calico um, in kind of state life um, uh, which my um, family were really tied up with um, in the Pilbara so um, and I had a strange thing where I had to have an arbitrary size for these works as well so they're a, a, a meter square I'm also thinking about how how country is viewed through that unit of measurement um, so in creating these works um, so doing this diet, these were diet in my backyard in Melbourne. Um, I was really kind of beginning to be stronger in my sense of connection to country by the fact of like my existence and my body being part of Indurundi country just inherently. Um, yeah. So with these works, I was really um, saying they don't they're not cut off from from country because I've made them and because they are natural diet but also because they're just objects I'm playing with in the world <laughs> um so this is uh um an installation called uh gently give attention um so this is the first sort of formalization of uh thinking about going from natural dyeing to then thinking about 
the making and consumption of tea. Um, so with this work, um, people could come into the space, uh, make their own cup of tea, uh, rinse the cups and utensils, and then um, reset the space for the next people to come along. Um, so, yeah, I was um, uh, beginning to think about connections to plants and water through tea, um, but also our responsibility to each other. Um, and others, yeah. That's wonderful. I, I'm i gonna, oh, actually. Oh, sure. Am I going over? <laughs> just a little bit, but I think it would be oh. wonderful if you would if you would just mention that last work, um, because this is also okay. oh, part of what we yeah. use. Yeah, it's just a gorgeous photo as well. <laughs> but if you want I'm to talk sorry. about this for a moment, okay. then we can go I'll, into that I'll just, discussion. Yeah, I'll just speak yeah. through the last two works. So this is clearing. You would have seen it in the promotional images for this um, talk. Um, so this was presented at Tarawara Museum of Art and um, it was very much um, like a bringing together of all of that thinking previously, the meditation, um, natural dyeing and creating a space for, um, for calmness. It also included texts by um, uh, Indigenous authors who were important to me and Wurundjeri authors as well, whose country this gallery is situated. Um, yeah, and this is the most recent work which opened last Saturday. Uh, it's called We Hold You Close. Um, it's presented at Pika for Perth Festival. And I work with uh, curator Eloise Sweetman, um, who's also from Perth, based in Rotterdam and runs um, Shimmer with her partner as well. Um, again, another kind of culmination of things. Um, the tea space is present. Um, a space for making, uh, but in this work, I've uh, circled back. So on this journey, I also found out that um, we have a very strong weaving and string making practice um, as Yinjirani women. And that um, uh, was kind of news to me and some of the women in Roburn as well in 2017. So it's kind of come back into our four. Um, so it's kind of bringing, um, yeah, uh, basically this is with these textile works, it's my way of making baskets with the resources that I have available to me, which at the moment is um, uh, a discarded fabric. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. If you wanna uh, then just go ahead and stop sharing your screen, we can all come back together. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do wanna follow up with you briefly, Katie, uh, on one yeah. question. Just a quick reminder to, the, to our audience to go ahead and, and put some questions in the Q&A so that we can uh, share them with, with both Thea and Katie uh, while we still have the time. Uh, there are a couple of questions there right now that we'll get to in a moment, but I am struck by something that comes across in, in a lot of your work, especially I'm just captivated by this idea of the practice starting by walking and, and walking through and reconnecting with the with country. One of the things about our Bumali exhibition, part of where we got our name was from a quote from Brenda L. Croft, you know, who's a First Nations artist and curator and, and educator uh, as well, who talked about that they were creating space in a very specifically urban environment, in an urban context at the time in 1987. <laughs> What I find so beautiful is today you're sort of expanding that idea of space for a contemporary indigenous artist practice outside of that urban context. Can you talk a little bit about being a, a contemporary, I mean, in terms of your practice, the materials you use, installations, video, you'll be having a very contemporary practice outside of the urban space as a First Nations artist. Um, uh, I guess I'm coming from it, from just wanting to give, give time and strength to this fluidity of place, perhaps. Like, um, I think 
uh, the kind of mindset I grew up within was that like the city's the city, it's concrete, like, and it's over here, whereas um, the countryside and all that and wild nature or whatever exists apart from it. I think those categories were just really, really strong. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose, um, I think, I'm, it's almost like, I don't wanna just ignoring it in a way, mm -hmm. like, or just bypassing it. Like, not to, not to put it lightly, but it's like, um, I've, I've really had to um, kind of, and this started with the decolonist work as well. I was beginning to imagine what would my identity be like if I was not uh, raised in this uh, colonized and highly racialized context. Um, so you do, and then since then I, have come to this sense that um, these, these cities do exist in country and they are of country as well, in a sense. So the materials aren't separate from country, even though these are materials in cases, just thinking of plastic and I'm working with synthetic materials a lot now, these materials are synthesized by human beings, but they're still of, of this earth. It's a, it's a wonderful answer. And I really like how you brought it back to the materiality, especially because that's because that also works back to the weaving that you talk about. Also, the working with your hands and the connectivity, this magic energy that gets created by the, the process of making. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your work and, and your practice. Thea, there's a, a, a question for you that uh, came across on the Q&A, specifically asking for uh, about um, Indigenous photographers who might inspire you or whose work has influenced you. It, it's hysterical. I worked uh, with the uh, practice of Michael Riley, who was a photographer. Um, very active in the 80s in Redfern, uh, in Sydney as well. Um, and he loved to take portraits, portrait phot photographs. And he always talked about portrait to him was very important because especially in, in taking portraits of women, he wanted to show Aboriginal women the way they wanted to present themselves, which was also a way they had never been seen before by, by sort of the the larger society. Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to bring Michael Riley into the conversation, but Fred's question is actually even better. Are there any indigenous photographers who have sort of influenced or inspired your practice uh, in your work with portraiture? Um, yeah, so I definitely say that um, Michael Riley is probably one of my um, biggest influences. Because, and especially that particular um, series, I just thought it was such a powerful way to like, you know, through the photograph, take charge of representation and present, yeah, exactly, present people how you viewed them and a fundamental kind of challenge to the gaze by presenting your own. And um, so, yeah, it's, and it's just, uh, his photographs are just so beautiful and poetic and lyrical as well. So also weaving in that beauty into that really strong expression. Um, I, but I'd also say too that um, Brenda Croft, um, Arnie Brenda, um, is a huge influence as well as a photographer. And two of the paintings, the ones um, of my mum and my auntie, the photo of my mum was actually up, like taken from or, or used one of Annie Rachel, uh, Annie Brenda's um, photographs as a reference. And I thought that that was a beautiful way of engaging in that tradition because there was a really strong tradition in um, at that time with portraiture. And then, but then again, infusing it with my view and my connection to my mom and all of these kind of things. Yeah. And, and I think that that sort of intimacy that you're able to bring out through your paintings is just is exquisite. 
your family has a is very public, has been very much a part of the public um, story of, of the land rights movement, of Aboriginal rights movement uh, in Australia. Yet your portraits, even of your family, I'm thinking specifically the one of your grandfather, and I think, uh, is it your Auntie Rachel? Is that who that was? That one has such an intimacy, such a, it's like a private moment that you, that you captured there that I don't think a photograph necessarily would do. Can you talk a little bit about sort of bringing out that intimacy um, with subjects who are very well known to those who will, will see the painting? Yeah, well, that um, painting was for the Alice Prize, and it's of, um, taken from a family photo that we have of Pop and Annie Rachel at the Tent Embassy. And again, a very kind of um, big historical kind of documented um, event. But I wanted to, yes, lean into the personal element. And I think it's been, um, you know, a great privilege being um, family to these people, you know, with these huge legacies, but also understanding the human scale and knowing that, um, you know, taking action on these things, it starts with very small steps and it's achieved with lots of people together. So I wanted to kind of convey that in the painting and it's this image of them out of the action on periphery of the action, having this beautiful aside and you can see that, you know, that beautiful bond and yeah, it's wonderful because I think that's for me when I'm looking at it that's where that glimmer becomes apparent and and I didn't realize that that's what I was connecting to but that feels like you know, when you showed that installation view of the paintings with the the shimmering water that that same sense comes across in your portraits which which I think is just just magnificent uh, Katie, there's a question uh, from the Q&A for you, and this is from Leslie, specifically asking about, um, about this process of bundling, of, of, of selecting uh, plants. And I'll read the question, it says, do you find the plants art country to be suggesting ways of healing, specifically from the illness or trauma that came after physically encountering the stolen generations history in your travel. Okay. So does that make sense? Does that? Um, so the plants themselves having healing properties or? It, it was, did you get a sense that working with these plants through your art and on country, if these were working together to create sort of a healing potential to deal specifically with the, with the stolen generations trauma that you were uh, confronting? Yeah, I, well, I found, um, so the natural dying was important when I had no knowledge of uh, ways of making um, that were part of my family history. Um, and uh, yeah, initially it was, um, just to, to um, I wanted the fabrics I was working with to have a direct connection to country. So, um, and also the, the place that an installation would be shown. So um, uh, that's why it was important initially. And, um, but the, the kind of um, experience of um, a, a meditative experience, which I, I, find inherently has uh, that sense of healing to it um, that came through uh, the walking and and collecting aspect so um, I was uh, walking along um, the um, the Birrung and um, getting to know that that place through making the work um, so I found that um, yeah, very, very, very grounding. Um, you start to notice uh, different animals around you, uh, particular plants when they're flowering. Um, I think it became, uh, I started to think about it as a way to become familiar with the seasons as well. And um, off the back of that 
um, residency in Roeburn, I was wondering about um, ways to create a, um, a sort of reconfigure my practice into something that was more seasonally responsive. Um, but also in doing the dying in a group setting, um, it becomes a social gathering um, that uh, kind of connects people because you're all doing the same thing um, and you're sharing that process. And there's also quite a bit of time just sitting around a fire as well. Um, so there's kind of um, those in between times where you're not you're not actively doing something as well you're kind of just waiting um, and I think there's there's opportunities for um, connection and intimacy in that and that's the that's the part I find um, has has healing to it. I, that, it's a wonderful thing to share because this is something that came across in so much of the work we're doing in preparation for the exhibition is that the creation of community, those moments of community became the practice in, in a way, in and of itself. And uh, these, these artifacts that exist become sort of markers of that, which is, which is quite, quite lovely. We have um, a question for both of you. We'll start, start with Katie, just to get an idea of your background in art education and, mm -hmm. and practice. How did you find your way to art you were talking about doing health courses. So yeah. how are you, how did you find your way to art? Um, I, I studied art um, and undergrad straight out of university. Um, so yeah, it has been important for a long time. Art has always been present. I, I've always drawn and always made things. Um, and uh, I guess my other, history is that um, after studying visual art, I then did another undergrad in sociology because I, I was starting to um, uh, find that I just didn't have the language to talk about the, the issues I was dealing with. Um, yeah, and through that, sociolo sociology is how I ended up uh, gaining a tutoring role in um, Indigenous health. Um, yeah, uh, so I yeah had that university gig, but also um, uh, worked with the Link Up program for a year as well. Um, so if for those that don't know, that's a, um, a program which does family history research and um, reunions for um, members of the stolen generations. Um, yeah, so health and um, well-being has been a, a big part of. Um, things as well. Wonderful. And and Thea, what's your um, your art education background? How did you train to be a painter and, and an artist? Um, well, I, yeah, I've, it's something that I've always done as well. I've always drawn. Um, and it's, yeah, I guess just always been a natural way for me to express myself or kind of difficult things that I was um, processing in my life. Um, I, out of school, I also um, did um, an undergrad um, where I was, did um, philosophy units as well and found them very useful. Um, but I, it actually, like a formal um, art education didn't actually resonate with how I worked. So after um, I deferred the last kind of part of it, um, but I'd say that my, um, primary kind of education has been through my mother and who's a curator. So I've kind of all through my life, I've been visiting art centers, going to galleries and kind of reading with reading about work and reading theory and engaging with artists. And then what's also been kind of interesting is that because I didn't have that formal training, my painting's been largely self-taught in many ways and so it's been really interesting also kind of establishing technique and playing with color science yeah that's wonderful well it we have uh hit the for us eight o'clock hour so we we've hit the hour on our webinar but i we have another question on the 
in the Q&A section. It's for both of you. And I think this might be a good place to sort of uh, look forward uh, and, and to, to bring our conversation somewhat to a close. What's next? Thea, if you want to start, what are you working on? What are you looking forward to uh, in the immediate future with your practice? Um, so next for me is, again, um, going through archives, but specifically looking um, through um, like POPs history, especially with um, early kind of um, Sydney history. Um, yeah, and so working towards shows for that and then later on in the year um, and visiting Alice again this year and getting some, um, yeah, looking forward to making work about that later in the year. Wonderful. And Katie? Um, so with the um, bits of natural, naturally dyed fabric, I'm sort of expanding to found fabric. Um, and with that, I'm playing with colour a whole lot more. And I'm also reconnecting with like uh, the sewing skills I learnt as a kid too. Um, so I'm getting into freehand sewing. Um, uh, that's been a big part of the, the exhibition um, recently. Um, and the form I'm pretty obsessed with at the moment is this basket form. Um, and uh, it's been a way for me to um, think about the, the variation in uh, that craft over millennia. Um, so with each, each piece, I really treat each one as an individual. Um, and also it feels like a way to um, uh, think about all of the people in that history as well. Um, yeah. That's great. I appreciate that. Well, I hope looking to the future, there's also an opportunity as, as the pandemic starts to go by the, the ways that hopefully uh, that maybe you'll find, both of you will find your ways to Charlottesville at some point and visit us at Kluge Roo. Um, and that maybe we get a chance to come out and visit you at some point. I'm personally obsessed with Redfern. So uh, Thea, it would be wonderful <laughs> to, to, to experience that, talk with you about that. And Katie, your work with the, with the with on country is just beautiful. I really, really appreciate your sharing uh, your practice with us and your process. Margo, do you have any questions to sort of close us out for this evening? I don't have any questions, but I just want to say how um, how I'm so impressed by both of these artists. And um, you know, this has been a great discussion. Uh, you're you're a really interesting complement to one another, so different in your practice, and yet um, both of you are so thoughtful in your work and the way it articulates larger issues. And uh, we're just really excited to be able to talk to you this way. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brendan. You did a great job moderating the conversation. Again, thank you all so much for sharing your, your um, art practice and uh, your wonderful creativity and talking to us about it. So.